Greetings and welcome to Vanderbilt University School of Nursing's Informatics 101. I'm Patty Sengstack and I'm the Director of the Nursing Informatics Program here at the School of Nursing. And I'm Alvin Jeffrey. I'm a postdoc fellow with the Department of Veterans Affairs and also on faculty here at the School of Nursing. Hi, I'm Kelly Aldrich. I'm the Chief Clinical Transformation Officer at the Center for Medical Interoperability and I'm also on staff at faculty here at Vanderbilt. I teach informatics with Patty. And we are thrilled that you are here today to join us. Thank um, you. We're going to be tackling a pretty heavy topic here, interoperability. Interoperability. That's eight wow. syllables. It sure so is. there must be something about the complexity of a concept, the more syllables that it has. Right? So we, what, is, what is the definition of interoperability? Do we have... Uh, you know me. Do we happen to have one? I happen to, to have our one. dictionary friend, Alvin. <laughs> yeah. Can you help us? Pulled this from the internet. So interoperability, uh, according to the Health Information Management System Society, or HIMSS, is the ability of different information systems, devices, or applications to connect in a coordinated manner within and across organizational boundaries to access, exchange, and cooperatively use data amongst stakeholders with the goal of optimizing the health of individuals and populations. That sounds easy. That wasn't Checked that, that wasn't that bad. Uh, but still, <laughs> the Kelly, definition might be simple. Is yeah. interoperability easy to achieve? Well, but you what, know, Kelly, so, what is it? Yeah, so Tell well, us, I what would is love it? to say something about that. That's great that you found that one definition. But if you ask any clinician, they're all going to have their own definition of what clinical interoperability is. What's your so definition? My definition is seamless exchange of data information to accelerate care for all. That's good. Can we quote you on that? You can. It's also our mission statement at the oh. center. <laughs> but OK, so honestly, how would you explain it to a relative who's right. not in this field? You know, I think sometimes when we get together, we, we get yeah. it. Um, but yeah. how, how would you explain it? I, I think it's, um, it's actually pretty simple. It's how do machines talk to one another and how can we use that data for information and advanced knowledge as well as support the cognitive knowledge worker that our bedside clinicians should be. So you were talking in a previous session about clinical decision support and you're really without interoperability not going to be able to get to a true and I'll use the term data liquidity that can be used within that episode of care, applying it at the right time for the right context of that patient without truly having interoperability. I've heard you say the term liquidity a number of times mm -hmm. uh, in just hanging out with you. Can you unpack that a little bit more? I mean, is it liquid like it just it pours everywhere? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I think of. But It's a great question. And how I would answer that is every other industry has data liquidity except for healthcare. So think about how you go and you have access to all of your money at any ATM. Uh, that's a SWIFT data uh, platform network. So there's a SWIFT network that is allowing us to go to any ATM that we want to get our money, to do our transactions online, on our phone. There are platforms beneath the surface that innovation has been put on top of that, hmm. that allows for the data liquidity. We've seen it in cable industry, we've seen it in every single industry that a platform has actually transformed that industry. There is no agreed upon trusted data platform in healthcare. That's a problem. That is a real problem. And as we talk about what are barriers or where are failure points in care? It's because we don't have the right data in front of our frontline workers and they actually need the technology support, not support from the 1980s when I started practice as an open heart recovery nurse. We were the think tank managing all of the medical devices around that patient's bed. And if you go into that episode of care today, it is the same thing. They are working with siloed IV pumps, siloed ventilators, siloed beds, siloed, you name it, LVADs, ECMOs, anything. It's all siloed data, and it's locked down for proprietary 
resource reasons, interfaces that have to be paid for to those individual vendor companies to unlock that data. Your, your passion is showing. You're on your soapbox, and I love it. Um, can I clarify something? So this definition of interoperability, mm -hmm. from what I hear you saying, it, seem, it seems like there's an internal to an organization and external to an organization. So let me give you my what what I sort of perceive it as, and you can uh, add on to it. So within an organization, the, the examples that you just gave is data following, um, data following the patient no matter where they are inside an organization. So from an ambulatory clinic, maybe where they're getting a preoperative test done, mm -hmm. and then that data following them to the uh, surgical suite, then that data, all that data following them to the PACU, then the data following them to the uh, recovery room and then the floor or the ICU and the floor. So all those pieces of patient data that are important for making decisions follows them seamlessly, I think you use that term, mm -hmm. across the care continuum. So internal interoperability and making sure that the devices that are connected to the patient are part of that seamless continuity. But then there's this external mm -hmm. interoperability where a patient may get care with a different care provider across the street or in another town because they were visiting their parents and then that data then needs to follow them back home to be in the chart for when they need decisions made in the future. Is that, are there two, are there two types like there, that? Or? There are many layers to this okay. actually. So you have infrastructure as well as what I'll call a digital citizen. So a digital citizen truly has the data around them so that you're known into your episode of care. I think any practicing clinician would want to know, have you received your flu vaccination at Walgreens. Once or when or when was that last? Um, say if you come in, you're in a car accident, we know nothing about you. You are an unknown to that anesthesiologist who's ready to put you under because you had some traumatic event. These are real problems that our clinicians face. They have true clinician burden, and we are not using the data liquidity from a trusted platform in order to improve that patient's episode of care. And I would say another thing is, I think it's a kaleidoscope. Mm -hmm. I think it's based on who is looking for the data and for what reason. So we have, we want to improve outcomes. We want to provide safe care. We want to uh, support research. We want to simply improve this patient's experience. There are so right. many the optics, aim. so mm -hmm. many optics that we could look at it. And, and I say that it's all about a kaleidoscope. So if you're a practicing anesthesiologist, if you're a nurse informatician, if you're a researcher or an educator, you're going to look at interoperability different and how it fits into you. And frankly, in the absence of that platform that we don't have in healthcare, you're not going to get to that. Hmm. Could I share an example I have when I get a question from some of my uh, students about kind of why don't we, I think they yeah. hear all this and they think mm -hmm. this is great and I, let, let's do it, you know, let's go for it. And I, you know, proprietary, mm -hmm. but, but, but really why can't we send mm -hmm. data from, you know, one organization to another? The example I give, and correct me if this doesn't make sense or I'm wrong about this, but, you know, if you're over here in hospital A, mm -hmm. you've created your electronic health record uh, and you record something as simple as a patient's date of birth. In the computer, you have to give that column a heading, you know, you have to, you have to figure out where to store that and what, what it's going to mm -hmm. call that in its spreadsheet. And so you decide to call it date of birth. Super mm -hmm. complicated, I spell it right? Out, right. But over here in Hospital B, when you created your electronic health right. record, you called it DOB. Mm -hmm. It was a nice abbreviation that made sense to the people developing it. And so when a patient comes from Hospital A to Hospital B, the computer over here is looking for something that says date of birth to be able to pop, or looking for DOB to populate a field. There's nothing in that patient's record that says DOB. Uh, and so something in the middle or somewhere along, either everyone on the hospital, each hospital has to redefine or re-say this is, we're all going to call it date of birth or whatever we decide to call it, which is what some common data models do, or to translate that so that when it sends out, it converts everything. Is, is that, I mean, on a kind of simple example, is that? 
So what's lacking? I mean, one of the things that's, that's lacking? That's one spoke. Okay. So Dr. Stead, uh, who is a mm -hmm. very well-known informatician from Vanderbilt, is actually the chairman of our Technology Advisory Council. And he has uh, summarized the interoperability maturity model, and I'd be happy to share that. Maybe yeah. we can post it for the students. And it has to do with looking at all spokes of interoperability. So you were describing, describing semantics, which our students should learn about semantic interoperability. There is true nomenclature mapping that should be done so that the data scientists can actually look at this huge data lake and be able to make sense of this. Instead of like what you just described is they look for certain data elements and they can't get to that data. So there's voids and, and lack of ability to escalate that research. So you have cybersecurity, you have syntactic, you have semantic. You also have when you talk about human factors, I know, Patty, you're very interested in human factors. Mm -hmm. You also have how is the clinician interacting with the data? So is it automated? Is there a high reliability associated from learning something to forcing a function? There are not too many airline pilots who have a problem with forcing functions as they're flying a plane. We, as clinicians, somehow think that it's above us to have a force function. We really need to stop thinking that way. And if we were relying on technology in helping support and reduce the clinician burden, we probably would stop harming patients due to medical errors. Mm. You, know, you, mentioned, you mentioned about human factors, and yeah, you know, that's when I get on my soapbox. And when I think about interoperability and usability, I think they, they too kind of go hand in hand and there's a good mm -hmm. partnership there because yeah. I think about an example where um, the information from an outside or external healthcare organization is sent to a provider that you're going to see and it comes in a PDF, right? So for, um, for those that... I probably most it's listening like know what a PDF is, file. but it's just a mm -hmm. flat file and it's just like a picture um, that you can't get any discrete data out of. Right. And it gets plunked into a tab with a bunch of other um, PDF files. And so the data is there. You can say there's interoperability, um, but when you are a provider and you're looking at the patient in front of you and you're seeing what the last you know, vital signs were and medications, chances are it's going to be a real challenge to click on the tab and sort of go through and find that file and read through it and and find it you know it's so like not, not really user friendly you and I, I, don't, I don't even know if i want to bring this up but i will so my <laughs> That's useful. She's going off script. I am She's I'm going off script. Way. What? Useful, safe, and satisfying is what you just described, and I've been using it. Useful, as, safe, and satisfying. Yeah, and if you can fit that and answer that to every every piece of this, yes. Either it fits in or it doesn't. If it doesn't fit under one of those categories, it's not useful to the clinicians. Uh, I, that's perfect. And it's a model I've used for over ten years. So when I moved to Nashville, I needed my records from where I previously mm -hmm. lived in another state. Mm -hmm. And so I got them electronically. And it was a 447 page PDF. Was that useful? <laughs> no. Was it providing safe care for you or satisfying? It was very satisfying no. to no. see that large of an attachment. So you bring, you bring up a great point, meaningless abuse. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know that actually interoperability was removed from meaningless abuse? Okay. So, <laughs> did you have a useful, safe, and satisfying I, I, experience I did not. as you I did transitioned not. your care? I did not. It was a challenge. There's no doubt. I'm, I'm still looking. I'm still looking to You're find. Still combing the data. Well, I need to find out when I had my um, measles, mumps, and rubella um, booster shot. Yeah, Vanderbilt's trying to find mine too. Yeah, yeah. I need um, to provide that. So, so let's talk about mm -hmm. if I if I'm a new nurse. Mm -hmm. nursing informaticist. Yeah. What are some things that I should be thinking about or what should I know? What are some core competencies in the area of, of interoperability? I would say that you definitely should look at the semantics. I agree with you, Alvin, the semantic interoperability. 
But that's almost forcing a function that we haven't allowed for data liquidity. Mm. So where's the translator in the platform? Uh, so, so there's different levels. I would say that um, getting involved with networking with the organizations as a new informatician, the ANEA, AMIA, uh, HIMSS, those provide wonderful networking as well as introduction courses. Those, those are wonderful resources for people that are breaking into the field. And um, when you help us teach the content here, I'm sure you'll be making sure that you cover some of the interoperability content very yes. well, won't you? <laughs> In great detail. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. I mean, it, it's true, it is very, it's a really important topic. Yes. I mean, you, you've made the point many times that it's, it's about patient safety. Mm -hmm. It's about good care, good quality care, and really meeting the quadruple aim. Right. Absolutely. Are you trying to steal my wrap up? You, you're no. like heading into it. You know, I take you, notes you here. I know, and you do such a nice job. <laughs> well, my takeaways uh, are that I loved that you brought up the idea of the digital citizen and being known, because I think that at, that's an expectation of patients that they're known, mm -hmm. and we're not stepping up to the plate on that one and providing that. Past medical history, past surgical history. So, and then you said, can you remind me of your mission? See, it's the seamless exchange. Accelerating uh, seamless exchange of data and information for all. What she said. I yeah, like that. I like said. that. <laughs> um, and that if we can get a trusted data platform, and healthcare is the only right. uh, profession where we don't have it, right. then we could innovate on top of that and I think make some really great strides. Mm -hmm. um, and then last three words, that it should be useful, safe, and satisfying. So yes. any, any other thoughts? Yeah. All right. That's great. Thanks well, for having me. I want to thank you, Kelly, for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for listening in. We hope you enjoyed this session. Uh, please feel free to share the video with your colleagues via email or social media. And if you have questions or feedback, please contact us at the link below. Until next time.